I must start by saying it is actually amazing to see the rapid and continued growth of the Flink community and user base. My name is Anand Dyer, and as Costas mentioned, I work um, at Google Cloud. I'm a product manager at Google Cloud, and I work um, in products under the Big Data Analytics product portfolio. Today, I'm excited to, to stand here and talk about a topic that I personally am quite passionate about, which is making the power of big data, big data processing, and big data analytics available to a much wider audience and to newer audiences. As Stefan alluded to, it's a goal that is shared by the Apache Flink and the Apache Beam communities. But before I start talking about what the two communities are working on today, I actually want to take a few minutes to acknowledge the rich history of collaboration between these two communities. Um, the two communities have been collaborating for a while and have actually um, collaborated on a few concepts that have furthered the state of the art of big data processing. A few noteworthy concepts are the unification of batch and streaming, um, comprehensive streaming semantics with a focus on streaming correctness, and even today, the communities are collaborating on extending or furthering the state of the art of streaming SQL. And this is actually a collaboration that is ongoing with the Apache CalSide community as well. But now let's talk about what the communities are focusing on, on today, which is extending the, the reach of big data processing, expanding the horizons of big data, making it available and accessible to newer audiences. And we're doing that in two ways. First, we want to take a flexible and powerful big data batch and streaming framework like Flink and make it available in multiple different programming languages. Not everyone codes in Java and Scala. Now, you may point out that there are Python SDKs out there. And yes, there are Python SDKs, but traditionally, the Python SDKs have lagged behind the Java solutions. Um, and, and often, the, the Python solution can be a little patchy. But even if you include Java and Python, not everyone codes in these two languages. There are multiple you know, popular programming languages out there. And we want to make big data accessible to audiences in the language of their choice. To tell someone that, hey, if you want to use big data first, go learn Java and Python, and then you can do big data processing is not acceptable. So that's the first way in which we're expanding the audience. The second way in which we're expanding the audience is by identifying compelling use case categories or verticals that leverage big data and building domain-specific tools and libraries. Now, if you think about a domain expert within a particular domain, that expertise is in that domain, and chances are they're not also a big data expert. So to give them a general purpose big data framework and, and to tell them, hey, go learn this big data framework and then start building applications on top is not the, the, the optimal way to go. So what we want to do is identify specific domains and then make big data accessible to audiences in that domain within the context of that domain. And I'll talk about how we're doing that. So first, let me talk about how we're making the power of Flink available in multiple different programming languages. And the key enabler there is the Apache Beam model. The Apache Beam is a, a popular open source um, big data SDK. And at the core of Apache Beam is the cross-language portability framework. And the cross-language portability framework consists of language agnostic abstractions and protocols. It provides uh, a language agnostic representation of big data transformation pipelines, and multiple language SDKs can then be built that implement this language ag agnostic representation. Once a Beam application is written, it can be executed on multiple execution engines that implement the Beam model. And in, in Beam parlance, an execution engine is called a runner. So once a Beam application has been authored, it can be run on multiple runners that implement that Beam model. Of course, now if you're talking about supporting multiple different languages, you need the ability to run code, user-defined processing, user code, or user-defined functions within the runner. And of course, the, the user-defined processing, the, the language of user-defined processing is going to match the language of the SDK. And now if you want to support multiple language SDKs, you need the runners to support user-defined code in multiple different languages. 
To enable that, Apache Beam specifies protocols that cleanly specify how a runner can invoke language-specific processing. So, so that uh, an execution engine that may be authored in Java and runs on the JVM, and, and that's often the case, most of the, the big data processing engines are JVM-based, can cleanly execute user-defined code in multiple other languages. Now, this sounds like cool technology, right? And I, I kind of rushed through a, a core part of the Apache Beam model in less than two minutes. So you're wondering, wh why does this matter to you as an end user? It matters to you as an end user because this enables multiple language SDKs without compromise. Because all the language SDKs are actually going through the same framework. So they uniformly leverage the capabilities of the runners. Every SDK gets uniform functionality, the same robustness, and the same scalability. So you as an end user, if you're using a non-JVM SDK, you don't have to worry that it is a compromise over the Java SDK. You can use multiple languages without compromise. Today, the Flink and Beam communities, along with contributors from places like Lyft and Get In Data, are working on building a Flink runner for Beam's cross-language portability framework. I should mention that this Flink runner today is in a prototype stage. It's, it's still a work in progress. And when it's ready, it will enable you to author very comprehensive and robust Flink applications using Beam's Python SDK. If you want to follow along and, and keep tabs on the progress of the Flink runner, you can follow along by tracking the Jira Beam 2889, or you can follow along on the Apache Flink and Apache Beam blogs, because we'll provide updates on those blogs. But as I alluded to, we don't want to stop with Java and Python. Today, we're working on a Go language SDK. The Go language has actually grown in popularity quite a bit in the past few years, and Go users want to author big data applications too. So to that end, we're building a Go SDK, which will let you leverage the power of Apache Flink with the Go language. Um, I should mention that this SDK is also a work in progress today. It's in prototype stage. Um, it currently supports a few batch workloads, and streaming workloads are on its roadmap. Before I move on, I want to mention that that blue gopher over there is actually the logo for the Go language. I didn't just put it on the slide for, you know, to add some color or humor to, that, to my slides. Uh, that happens to be the, the colorful logo for the Go language. Now let me talk about the second dimension of extending the reach of big data processing, which is by building domain-specific tools and libraries. And of course, when you're talking about a domain that is tightly coupled with big data, that leverages big data, the, the first and obvious choice is machine learning. Machine learning and big data today are effectively tied at the hip. Um, and machine learning is top of mind for many enterprises across the globe. Let's do a quick show of hands. Please raise your hands if either you or your team are currently exploring machine learning or, on big data or plan to do so in the near future. A quick show of hands. Awesome, yeah, that's, uh, that's a big chunk of the audience. So this is great, because the, the next couple of slides are very relevant to you. Over the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about an, a couple of open source libraries authored on Beam's Python SDK that will let you leverage the power of distributed framework like Apache Flink for building robust production machine learning pipelines that also leverage the TensorFlow library. Now, this initiative, it's part of a broader initiative started by the TensorFlow ecosystem and the TensorFlow community. Um, and, and today, I'll give a preview to two critical libraries uh, that, are, that are being built and open sourced. But first, I want to provide some context. Doing machine learning in production is hard. And that is consistent feedback that you get from anyone that has tried it. And when I talk about machine learning in production, I'm not talking about one-off ad hoc construction of models or exploratory data science. I'm talking about building production applications that rely on a robust and reliable and continuously running production pipeline. And that has to be a pipeline that can be updated as new data becomes available. 
So that's what I mean by production machine learning. And doing that is hard because in addition to the actual core machine learning model code, there are a whole bunch of other stages that you need to build and orchestrate. A lot of moving pieces that you need to, to orchestrate together and, and run in, in synchrony. And this assertion is based on years of experience building production machine learning applications at Google. So Google has been doing this for many years, and, and over, years, uh, over the years, the, the accumulated experience has shown that you need a bunch of stages. You need stages for data cleansing, data processing and transformation, data validation, feature engineering, and then you have to do model analysis. You need monitoring, and, and so on and so forth. Bunch of moving pieces. Today, I'll talk about two libraries which will address two critical pieces in this diagram. The first library I want to talk about is called TensorFlow Transform. And TensorFlow Transform, authored on Beam's Python SDK, and it can be run on the Flink runner, it helps with feature transformation. Now, when you're doing machine learning, either you're training a model or you are using a pre-trained model to score new events. In either case, you take your raw inputs and you apply a bunch of transformations on them to produce the features that are then fed to the model. And that is called feature engineering. Now let's look at typical ML pipelines. First, let's look at the training phase. If you're doing machine learning on large data sets, the feature engineering phase often happens as a batch processing job. Now, the, the model serving, and when, when I say model serving, I'm referring to taking a pre-trained model and then using it to score new events as they become available. Model serving may happen in multiple different contexts. The key thing is the feature engineering that was performed needs to be consistent both for model training and model serving. If there is any discrepancy in the feature engineering, the, when you do scoring with your model, the results are going to be completely unpredictable. So you, you need the feature engineering to be identical in both cases. And that actually happens to be hard. And, and the reason it's difficult is because the training phase and the model serving phases often happen in completely different environments. Now, the training phase often on big data happens in a batch processing framework, so on a distributed compute framework, you may have authored that using a Python SDK, for example. Now, model serving happens in multiple different contexts. It can happen in a batch context, a streaming context, or it could happen within a live application where you have, say, JVM-based microservices doing the, the model serving. So you had training happen in Python code, you have serving happening in Java code, different languages, different environments, and keeping the, the feature transformations in sync it's not trivial. It can be difficult. And often, when they get out of sync, debugging that and identifying issues is incredibly hard. So that's where TensorFlow Transform comes in. With TensorFlow Transform, you author your feature engineering with the, the TensorFlow Trans Transform library. And then you run your batch uh, training phase on a distributed compute framework, such as Apache Flink. And at the end of the batch processing, after the feature engineering is done in the batch processing phase, what TensorFlow Transform does is it outputs a TensorFlow transformation graph. And now you can attach that TensorFlow transformation graph along with your model serving graph. And that TensorFlow transformation graph along with the, the model serving graph, it's all executed within TensorFlow code. Now, because you had to author your feature engineering once using TensorFlow Transform, and after that, it provided that TensorFlow graph to you, you can leverage that Transform graph wherever you're doing model serving, and you're guaranteed that it's going to be consistent. You, as an end user, don't need to do anything extra. You merely author your feature engineering using TensorFlow Transform, and it kind of helps you take care of the, the rest of the different phases and keep them in sync. Not only does TensorFlow Transform help you with keeping training and serving in sync, it actually just comes with a rich collection of pre-implemented feature transformations. So in many cases, you actually don't have to implement something from scratch. You can just use a, a pre-existing implementation. Um, and not only that, it actually helps you 
embed exist pre-trained models as part of your feature engineering. And this, honestly, is a, an increasingly popular paradigm where when you're doing feature engineering, you take your raw inputs, you perform some feature engineering, you run them through a model. Now, the model produces some outputs, and you take those outputs as features and then feed them to the final model. And this is an increasingly common paradigm, and TensorFlow Transform makes that easy as well. Now, I'd love to get into more details about TensorFlow Transform, but in the interest of time, I'm going to have to point you to the GitHub repo. The GitHub repo comes with examples, um, documentation, and so forth. So I'd please check out the GitHub repo. And next, I'll talk about the second library that has recently been open sourced, which is called TensorFlow Model Analysis. And again, TensorFlow Model Analysis is written with uh, Beam's Python SDK, can be executed on a distributed framework such as Apache Flink. And what TensorFlow Model Analysis does is it lets you do distributed at scale evaluation of your model, your newly trained models, and then it produces some metrics that you can slice and dice to understand how your model performs on different subsets of the data. Now, let me explain why it is important to do the slicing and dicing. In machine learning, there are common metrics that are used to evaluate a model, precision and recall. Uh, an increasingly common metric is the ROC curve, where you're trying to increase the area under the curve. Now, if you just boil down the performance of your model to a single metric, it doesn't give you the complete story. Now, so this is the performance of a particular model, but the model may perform very differently on different subsets of the data. For example, with group A, this model happens to perform really well, but for group B, the performance of this model is terrible. Now, what if group B happens to be a more lucrative subset of your user base? Or what if these differences are actually indicative of some biases that have creeped into the model? And this can happen for multiple reasons. It may happen because you have insufficient training data for a particular subset. It may happen because uh, the model didn't have sufficient capacity to learn the, the data it's being fed. It may happen because you have sufficient training data, but there are implicit biases in your training data. Multiple reasons, but if you're doing machine learning at scale and building production applications, it's important to take new models and evaluate them on multiple slices of your test data or evaluation data. So with TensorFlow model analysis, you get to take your new model, do evaluation at scale on the distributed framework. It produces a bunch of metrics, and then you can visualize those metrics in a Jupyter notebook using the, the front-end components that are actually available with TensorFlow model analysis. Then you can do some interactive slicing and dicing just like this animation over here is depicting. This is fairly compelling. Um, and again, in the interest of time, I'm going to have to point you to the GitHub repo that comes with documentation and samples. For TensorFlow model analysis, there's also a new blog post that was authored. That's a pretty long URL. What I'd recommend is just go to Google and type in TensorFlow model analysis blog post, and it'll, it'll take you to this link. So a couple slides back, I showed you, um, I presented a slide that had a bunch of different stages that are required to build a robust machine learning pipeline. And then after that, I've only sh depicted or I've only shared solutions for two of those stages. So, so clearly, at this point, you're wondering, you know, what about those other stages? If, if you need a bunch of solutions to build a robust pipeline, when is that going to become available? Now, it would have been really cool if, if I could stand up here and say, hey, you know, I'm Today, I'm open sourcing a whole bunch of solutions or presenting a whole bunch of open source solutions that will solve all those problems for you. That, unfortunately, is not the case today, but it's, it's happening. It's a work in progress. These um, tools required to build robust pipelines and open sourcing of these tools is part of a broader initiative started by the TensorFlow community called TensorFlow Extended. This YouTube link uh, provides, it, it will take you to a talk that provides additional details about TensorFlow Extended. And again, it can be difficult to follow that link, so just go to YouTube and search for TensorFlow Extended, um, and it'll take you to a talk which was recently delivered at TensorFlow Summit that provides an overall overview. In addition to that, the TensorFlow community has produced a research paper. 
Um, they published a research paper last year at a fairly prestigious conference called KDD. And that research paper provides a good overview of the problem space that TensorFlow Extended is planning to, to tackle. And over the course of the coming months, multiple open source um, tools will be built and, and open source to the community. And, and not only that, TensorFlow model analysis and TensorFlow Transform will also continue to be revved with new capabilities. So do check this out, particularly if you want to build production machine learning pipelines. Now, machine learning is a very obvious case for big data, a particular big data vertical. I want to mention that that's not the only vertical that the, the community is tackling. Genomics is another domain that highly leverages big data. And there's work ongoing to build libraries that simplify genomics processing. In particular, in, in the, the domain of genomics, there's a popular file format called the VCF format that's used to store genomic sequences and the differences between those sequences. And in the Beam community, there's work ongoing to build libraries that make it simple to read and write VCF files and analyze them at scale. So that's another example of a domain-specific vertical that we're, that we're tackling. So I want to close by saying, come join us. The work is not done. There's plenty of work to be done to expand the horizon of big data. The, the Flink runner, as I mentioned, is currently in prototype stage, and it needs to be completed so it can support batch and streaming workloads. We've started work on the Go SDK, but that currently only supports batch, and there's plenty of work to do add streaming support. Um, and there are discussions in the community about adding JavaScript support. JavaScript is a, a really popular language for application developers. And then lastly, there are multiple domains to go tackle and build domain-specific vertical libraries. A good example there is uh, time series analysis. There are discussions in the community about building solutions for time series. So long story short, there is plenty of work to be done, and we'd love for you to join the, the Beam and Flink communities and tackle these domain spaces, tackle these problems, and extend the horizon of big data. Thank you.